This week, Texas lawmakers will get to work at the Capitol, and so will the outside groups trying to shape public policy in the state. The number one issue that Texans want to happen is that this year's property tax bill is lower than last year's. We'll introduce you to the leaders of two of the state's most influential policy groups and see how their work could change the laws in Texas. Ready to tackle some of the biggest issues and challenges of our generation. Texas women help change the balance of power in Washington. How the state's newest members of Congress are making history as they work to make a difference in D.C. Hello and thank you for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. The balance of power shifted in Congress this week and some Texans are playing a part in the historic change. Democrats took control of the House of Representatives and launched a new effort to end the government shutdown. Our Anna Wernicke has details from Washington. Josh, as the new 116th Congress was sworn in, lawmakers got right to work looking to end the government shutdown as soon as possible. It's straight to work for the new 116th Congress. I'm so ready to get to work. The House welcomed a number of new faces, including Texas Democrat Veronica Escobar. And it was a familiar face that took back the role of Speaker in the new Democrat-controlled House. I pledge that this Congress will be transparent, bipartisan, and unifying. Pelosi says the first order of business is to end the government shutdown. House Democrats say they have a plan to fund the government agencies, but not President Trump's border wall. We've got to reopen the government. This is absurd that the government is shut down over a singular issue. We want to see strong border security uh, minus a 14th century uh, solution called the wall. President Trump says without money to build a border wall, there's no deal and the shutdown will continue. But House Republicans insist the president will compromise. I really think the ball's in the court of the Democrats, both House and Senate, to come back with a counteroffer. I'm open. And I think this president is. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says the Senate won't vote on anything without the president's support. So let's not waste the time. Let's not get off on the wrong foot. Pelosi says once the government is reopened, they'll be able to focus on other priorities like health care and immigration. For State of Texas in Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. Two Texas women made history when they took the oath of office on Thursday in Washington. Veronica Escobar and Sylvia Garcia are among 102 women now serving in the U.S. House. That's a new record. But Escobar and Garcia also made Texas history. They're the first Latinas to represent the state in Congress. Escobar calls it a privilege to serve. This has been a journey that I never imagined that I would be on, and I feel so grateful to the community for allowing me the opportunity and the privilege. I'm so ready to get to work, ready to reopen the government, ready to tackle some of the biggest issues and challenges of our generation. Escobar posed for a photo this week with five other newly elected women posted on the Twitter feed of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The caption, Si se puede, Spanish for yes we can. Escobar promised to be active on border issues. She campaigned on opposition to President Trump's border policies and says she's against funding his border wall plan. She won the seat formerly held by Beto O'Rourke. The congressman did not run for re-election and instead ran for Senate, losing to Republican Ted Cruz. Vice President Mike Pence led the swearing-in ceremony Thursday for Senator Cruz. Afterwards, Cruz announced that he was named to serve on the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. He will continue to serve on the Judiciary Committee and on the Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation. This is his second term in the Senate. Despite his loss in the Senate race, a lot of people are watching to see if Beto O'Rourke will launch a campaign for president. He has not said whether he will run, but on Thursday, O'Rourke picked up an endorsement. Martin O'Malley, the former Democratic governor of Maryland and 2016 presidential candidate, says he wants Beto to run. O'Malley says he was impressed by O'Rourke's campaign for Senate. But another Texan is ready to announce his plans for a White House bid. Former San Antonio Mayor Julian Castro formed a presidential exploratory committee last month. That's a key step before launching a formal campaign. Castro scheduled an event for next Saturday where he's expected to announce he is running for president. 
The big story in Texas politics will happen this week at the state capitol. Lawmakers will get to work on Tuesday, kicking off the 86th legislative session. One week later is inauguration day for Governor Greg Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. Lawmakers have until March 8th to file bills, though there are exceptions for emergency items. And the last day of the legislative session is on Memorial Day. That marks 140 days from the start of the session. Since the election, we've been interviewing lawmakers from across Texas. They've all told us there are two priorities this session, school finance and property tax reform. But other issues are also getting attention before the session. One bill aims to make the state's current ban on texting and driving even tougher. The bill would require all cell phone use to be hands-free for Texas drivers. It would override local rules related to cell phone use by drivers. There are several bills to relax marijuana laws in Texas. One would allow Texans to use marijuana for medical purposes. Another would make it legal for Texans to possess small amounts of pot. And there's a new push to remove a Confederate plaque inside the state capitol. The wording claims slavery was not the underlying cause of a civil war. That is not accurate. It's been there since 1959, and next Friday, the State Preservation Board will meet to consider whether to take the plaque down. The meeting comes after an opinion from State Attorney General Ken Paxton, who said the board could act to remove the plaque without needing approval from state lawmakers. Texas lawmakers will make big decisions on policy in the next session, but a lot of those decisions will be based on research from groups outside the Capitol. Every Texan should be able to be healthy, well-educated, and financially secure, and what we do is use data to advance fact-based policy solutions. We'll meet the leaders of two of the most influential policy groups and see how their work could change our laws. A witness to history who helped bring those moments to you. Ann Richards, uh, at the time, we thought that was going to be a transitional governorship. I mean, she was like, we're ending the good old boy network. One of the state's top politics reporters is saying goodbye and reflecting on the big changes he's seen in Texas. We are just days away from the start of the next legislative session here in Texas. It's the start of a busy time for both lawmakers and the people who push po for policy changes. Joining us for some insight is Kevin Roberts, the executive director of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about your group. Where does it really fall on the political spectrum? Well, we're at 501c3, so we don't get involved in campaigns and elections. We are the largest public policy organization outside the nation's capital, so about 100 employees, most of whom work right here in downtown Austin. On the political spectrum, we are right of center. We're a conservative free market group. We believe that policies passed by the state legislature, by Congress, ought to focus on human flourishing. And usually that means that government needs to be limited in what it's doing. There's certainly a role for government, but there's a much more important role for human liberty. You know, we've been talking to a lot of um, lawmakers since the election, new lawmakers too. It seems like everyone's telling us the two main priorities for this legislative session are going to be school finance and property tax reform. Where do you see the solutions for those issues shaping up? Sure, I, I agree that those are two of the three priorities according to polling, which we have done and, and will make public soon. There's a third one, which is that Texans want more education for their money. We hear a lot of chatter about more money for education. I think the first thing that needs to happen is that we streamline the school finance system so that every dollar that the state spends on students actually follows the student to the school of their choice. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's really important to note that educational outcomes in Texas, which for years have been something we should be proud of, have become to, become to uh, stagnate. And as a result of that, I think that when we tackle educational outcomes, when we streamline the school finance system, that you necessarily have to deal with a property tax problem. It's clear, regardless of someone's political perspective and the polls that you see, that the number one issue that Texans want to happen is that this year's property tax bill is lower than last year's. So I would encourage our members of the legislature and people across the political spectrum to be really focused on those three issues. Because if we don't, if we fail to act, if we don't produce more education for our money, if we don't streamline the school finance system, if we don't make this year's property tax bill lower than last year's, 
Texas will stop being Texas. Yeah, how does your group really work with lawmakers to try to get them to act on those issues? Sure. We do what typical think tanks do, and that's a lot of research and white papers, but I think what distinguishes us is that we also advocate for those policies. And so we testified something like 600 times the last legislative session. So for Texans who are living outside Austin and interested in policy but don't necessarily have the time to do that, we sort of do that for them. And we have a number of policy priorities in addition to the three that we talked about. In fact, our long-running goal to have criminal justice reform done at the federal level was just signed into law by President Trump the Friday before Christmas, so we worked that issue in very much a bipartisan way. So our approach is we're going to tell the truth, we're going to do so with smiles on our faces, we're going to try to find the proper balance between human liberty and some involvement for government, and at the end of the day we want to make sure that we keep Texas, Texas, because as Texas goes, so goes America. You're also having a big event next week, bringing in some big names. Tell us about that. We are. Policy orientation is our big policy event each year. It is, we think, the largest policy gathering in the country. We start Wednesday, run through Friday. We have most of the statewide elected officials there, starting with Attorney General Paxton, who will be talking about the lawsuit that we filed against Obamacare with him. We have Lieutenant Governor Patrick, and the last day is punctuated by both U.S. Senators, Senator Cruz and Senator Cornyn, sitting down with me and talking about the state of affairs in Washington, D.C. In between those keynote addresses is a series of panels that focus on all of these policies. So if someone is not yet registered, because the event is sold out, they'll need to watch on our YouTube channel with the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Or if someone is living outside Austin, already registered, and decide they just want to sit at home in West Texas or in East Texas, they can tune in. Well, great. Kevin Roberts, thanks for being with us. You're about to get real busy. We are, but what a great opportunity. Thank you. Up next, we'll get a different perspective on work to change policy in Texas. Every Texan should be able to be healthy, well-educated, and financially secure. And what we do is use data to advance fact-based policy solutions. We'll look closer at one of the state's most influential progressive groups and how they're working for change this session. From Bill Clements to Ann Richards, up through Greg Abbott, Archie Ratcliffe has reported on the key players in state politics. Now he's retiring and reflecting on the events that shaped Texas. Texas lawmakers will make big decisions on policy in the next session, but a lot of those decisions will be influenced by research from groups outside the Capitol. Joining us for some insight is Ann Beeson, the CEO for the Center for Public Policy Priorities. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great. Well, tell us a little bit about your organization. Where do you kind of align on the political spectrum? Well, we believe in a Texas that gives everyone, people of all backgrounds in Texas, the, the chance to compete and succeed in life. And we think that that means every Texan should be able to be healthy, well-educated, and financially secure. And what we do is use data to advance fact-based policy solutions that give everyone a fair chance. So we do not align ourselves with any particular political ideology. We work across the aisle to advance solutions that help all Texans. You know, we've been talking to lawmakers from both sides of the aisle since sure. the election, and a lot of them are telling us the two main priorities for the session are going to be school finance and property tax reform. Yep. Where do you see the solutions for those issues really falling? Well, first of all, we're just so excited about the new energy that a lot of newly elected leaders are going to uh, uh, bring to the Capitol. And we're delighted that the presumptive Speaker of the House, Dennis Bonin, and many other leaders um, have said that school finance is a top priority. Um, we have over 5 million public school students in Texas. And it is absolutely essential that the legislature roll up their sleeves and get to work in reforming our broken and very run-down and old-fashioned school finance system. Um, we think there are very real solutions. Those solutions will require money. Money matters in education. If we want to have the best teachers in Texas, if we want the smallest, the, you know, smaller classes that we know work better for students, if we want to see our graduations go, uh, rates go up, we have got to have um, adequate revenue and that is what the legislature is going to be looking at um, and in that sense there's a little bit of tension between the conversation about property tax reform and the widespread agreement across the state that we have got to reform our school finance system. Well, beyond those issues, where do you, other, where do you see the other key issues falling? Well, um, we really feel that it is absolutely time to look at 
um, access to health care in Texas. We are embarrassed to uh, report that Texas has the highest rate of uninsured people in the country. That is not good enough for our state. We are a wealthy state and we have the resources we need to ensure that everyone has access to affordable health care. There are over six billion dollars of federal money that Texans have already paid into the tax system and we think that it is a perfect time this legislative session for lawmakers to roll up their sleeves and to figure out what can be done to access those dollars so that we can stop being the lowest on the list in terms of access to health care and move towards the top of the list. You know, you mentioned Dennis Bonin. Who are some of the mm -hmm. other key players for those issues? Um, wow, there's, well, we, we won't really know for sure, really, until the committees are assigned. That happens a little bit later. We're excited that Representative Bonin has suggested that they may announce the kind of committees and committee chairs a little earlier than would have typically happened in prior sessions. And as soon as that happens, we will be knocking on those doors. And of course, we'll be doing a lot of knocking uh, on doors beginning on Tuesday, um, just to make sure that all of our bases are covered. And you know, uh, there's a lot of expertise inside the Capitol. There's a lot of new ideas that are gonna be brought in and we're gonna be talking to everybody to make sure that they have the information that they need to make great decisions for the people of Texas. You're about to be very busy for the next 140 days. That's right, <laughs> absolutely. And Beeson, thank you very much. Thank you. He had a unique view of some of the biggest stories in the state. When I started, there were Democrats running the state. Uh, of course, a lot of those Democrats uh, in a very short period of time became Republicans. Now he's sharing his perspective as he ends a career covering Texas politics. You're watching State of Texas. Lawmakers will go back to work at the Capitol this week, and so will the journalists who cover all the events under the dome. But one familiar face will be missing. Texas Monthly reporter R.G. Ratcliffe retired last week after nearly four decades of covering Texas politics. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. A lot of folks know your work from Texas Monthly, but you've been doing this for quite a while in Texas. How'd you get started? Well, I actually I started uh, in elementary school. I wrote for my elementary school newspaper, my high school newspaper. Uh, went to the uh, University of Missouri at Columbia, but uh, coming back to Texas, I actually, my first job, full-time job back here uh, as a reporter was with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and the Star-Telegram moved me to Austin in late 1982, and uh, it was just uh, kind of, the funny thing is how I got into politics was I was a general assignment reporter in Florida, and I was covering um, drug smuggling. And the, it was Pablo Escobar's uh, cartel was running cocaine through the coast of Florida. And they were bribing all sorts of uh, local officials to open up, pull police back from the docks and let the boat, shrimp boats come in loaded mm -hmm. with 25 tons of marijuana. And it just kind of got me interested in, in covering the politicians and what they do. And, and in particular, we had one fellow in Georgia named Roscoe Emery Dean Jr who tried to cut a deal with the uh, Cali cartel to finance his campaign for governor of Georgia. Uh, he ended up spending about five years in a federal prison over that. And it just translated immediately from uh, crime reporting to covering politics. Wow. You here in Texas have covered four decades worth of governors. Do any of them stand out to you? Well, they, uh, most of them have been very interesting in their own right. I mean, uh, Bill Clements was the first Republican governor since Reconstruction, and he was just a crusty old uh, <laughs> oil field guy, and, and Mark White was a very smart lawyer. Of course, Ann Richards, uh, at the time, we thought that was going to be a transitional governorship. I mean, she was like, we're ending the good old boy network, and, and she had... Uh, beaten the guy who, uh, Clayton Williams, who portrayed himself as more of a rancher than a businessman. And uh, then George W. Bush, of course, uh, became president of the United States. And Rick Perry was the longest serving governor. Actually, I hate to say it, but the, the least interesting one is our, most, our current governor, Greg <laughs> Abbott, who I still haven't figured out what he's looking to do as a legacy.
Mm -hmm. Well, you've seen some uh, interesting changes in Texas politics during that time. Um, what's something that really stands out to you? Well, when I started, there were Democrats <laughs> running the state. Uh, of course, a lot of those Democrats uh, in a very short period of time became Republicans. Uh, and they were kind of the business-oriented Republicans where it's like, we don't want anyone starved to death, but we don't want high taxes. Uh, over time, in the 1980s, the Christian coalition started building a huge base, and so now a lot of Republican politics are based in um, uh, fundamentalist uh, or evangelical Christian values, and uh, because they can control the primary cam uh, races, uh, that's been you know some of the the, the real huge change that occurred. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, the state went Republican when Ann Richards vetoed a non-binding referendum on uh, whether the state wanted concealed handguns. Mm. And uh, in the very next election, rural Texas went overwhelmingly Republican because of that one issue. And it has stayed rural Republican. Well, is there any <clears throat> story that you're most proud of, anything that you um, feel like you want to be remembered for? Well, uh, in the uh, late 1990s, I did a series of stories on um, how Governor Bush's uh, uh, campaign contributors and business partners were profiting off of investments by uh, the T Texas Teachers Retirement System and the University of Texas uh, uh, Management Company. Uh, a lot of investments were made with uh, firms that were associated with uh, uh, Bush and his campaign or with uh, Republican politics in general. And for at least a couple of years, those stories were used to teach uh, investigative journalism at Columbia University in New York. Quite a career. Congratulations on thank retirement. You. I hope you enjoy it, and don't be a stranger. Thank you. And thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. We'll be back next week to bring you an in-depth look at Texas politics.